Brad and uh, postdocs at Slack and Imperial uh, for the faculty positions at UPenn uh, and Dartmouth and Haverford. And Stefan is well known uh, for his connections with the cosmology of particle physics, uh, especially things like uh, connections to inflation and connections to uh, gravity. And today he's going to tell us about the dark energy of the constant sky. Oh, we've got some things before. We're going to talk about the sky. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Wayne. Um, yeah, the original title was In This, this In the Skies. And then I was telling my colleague Jim Bates, who's also brown, um, what sounds better to the skies. So that's how I got it. And plus I believe that there's one sky, actually. I don't believe there are many skies out there. <coughs> um, so, um, so anyway, it's a real a great honor and pleasure to be at Chicago. I have some I have some Chicago roots actually. Um, and it actually starts because I grew up in New York City. I'm from the Bronx, New York. And the one energy we have in Chicago, if you're from the Bronx, it's not baseball, okay? Um, um, is um, music. Um, Chicago is one of the places, if, uh, I'm also a musician, um, where there are lots, there were lots of great musicians. And I grew up also listening to a lot of um, electronic music. And Chicago is the home of house music, okay? So yeah. Um, and so for a 16-year-old kid like me, listening to house music, knowing it's from Chicago, made me very fond of Chicago. So it was good to, I never thought I'd be in Chicago, not in a house club, but in your house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna kind of give a little apology because um, this is a colloquium, and it was very hard writing this talk because um, there are gonna be some technical nuances in this talk, but this is Chicago, and people are very smart. And I'm going to ask you, those of you who, you know, uh, to bear with me, um, I, I would like to think I'm going to do an okay job of explaining um, some of the equations that I'm, I'm going to present you with. Um, so please don't fall asleep. And, um, or if you do, um, put some shades on. So, <laughs> All right. so um, if, of course, every cosmology talk will begin with this wonderful picture that I got off of um, a Google search. Um, and it tells a story of like, you know, so here's how, you know, the emission of the CMB photons and, you know, density perturbations grow into large scale structure. And, um, and, you know, we know that, you know, six parameters. Um, I was hanging out with some of the postdocs and we were talking about what these six parameters were. I'm not going to go into that. Determine our observed universe after the emission of the CMB. Um, and we have a microphysical mechanism. Um, inflation. It's something that Wayne and I and others here have worked a lot on. Um, in fact, the very first time I learned about inflation was as a graduate student, I, um, I ran into a book called The Early Universe by Uncle Rocky and, and Mike Turner. Um, and um, that's how I learned this stuff. And um, even when I was writing my book, I still refer back to that book. That's my other Chicago connection. Uh, we all grew up with that. So, um, so we have this mechanism that generates adiabatic supervising perturbations, of course, with the aid of dark matter to amplify those perturbations that would become our large scale structure. And of course, we have this lambda CDM paradigm. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, remains our current paradigm. Okay. However, we still don't understand how to reconcile if this thing is a cosmological constant, or even if it's not with the cold dark, with and cold dark matter, both separate things, with our standard model of particle physics and general relativity, whether or not it's, we have a quantum theory of gravity or, or, or not. And today we're going to explore this issue for dark energy. And pardon me, I will be, um, I'm going to be using dark energy and cosmological constant or lambda interchangeably. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, our standard cosmology, we have our beautiful Einstein field equations, and what we're looking at here is the bare cosmological constant, which is a thing that, you know, a constant, you can put into the Einstein equations without um, spoiling the diffeomorphism invariance of the theory. And we know if we assume 
a spatially homogeneous and isotropic um, space time. We have our Friedman equations here, and you can rewrite all this stuff into the common form, which is um, an equation that relates the Hubble rate, expansion rate, to different forms of matter. In this case, all of the baryonic matter will redshift as a Q radiation, cosmological constant will remain, will remain constant, and curvature. And we also know that um, if at equal matter radiation, those components will decay. And if you have either something that's looking like a cosmological constant, that's sort of the, the light blue area, and it's evolving slowly, or you have a cosmological constant, it will at some point catch up and dominate today. And Supernova, the supernova um, experiment basically tells us um, that as this curve actually has, um, you see that um, when we plot the effective um, expansion rate um, compared to um, redshift, we see that basically the, um, the universe is accelerated and we also see that if we combine this with time data, that the um, y-axis corresponds to a varying um, equation of state. So this is basically the relationship between the, um, the pressure and the energy density. And what we see that is that the data, the data this blue area, um, within 4 or 5%, I think my total is 4%, um, favors a pure cosmological constant. So we're looking at here in terms of the solutions of the Friedman equation. This, um, I guess, magenta line is lambda CDM, where the component of the C of, C of um, lambda is 0.7 of the critical density. Okay, so that's you know a standard jive that I have to give when I do a cosmology program. But now let's actually get into the heart of the matter. <clears throat> well, this is actually better. How do I? Well, this point you know, there's a little on button on this side. Or is it the right thing? Okay. Okay, thank you. So, um, actually, about 10 years ago, wait, is this? <laughs> the top up. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> a couple of ten years ago, I wrote a paper on voids, using voids to constrain to replace dark energy. So imagine we have a gigantic void, okay, um, and a bunch of galaxies and stars, and we have a giant void. So we're looking at a piece of empty space in our universe. But now something happens in our little tiny piece of space, and it's what happens if you if you um, play basketball with Rocky. <laughs> and piss them off. <laughs> what we're looking at here is a little cartoon of vacuum energy. And what we're seeing here is that this tiny little piece of space actually is very active with, and we have an we're looking at an amplitude of vacuum energy, and it's beating up the small ones, and, and it wants to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's kind of a picture, a little cartoon picture of vacuum space. But let's actually talk a little bit about what this vacuum energy really is. <clears throat> So what we're looking at here is, um, is um, the splitting of um, um, the p, p orbitals in hydrogen um, due to a quantum effect in quantum electrodynamics. And this is an electron basically exchanging a photon and having this so-called vacuum loop, vacuum polarization loop. All right? And so this is called a lamp shift. And if you will actually calculate it in the next slide, okay, or, or something similar to it. And basically, this is basically the shift in this energy that's been observed. This is what we learn when we all take quantum mechanics, or advanced quantum mechanics. And this picture is actually to represent a graviton leg now. So this is a photon and a graviton leg. And that's because of the equivalence principle. So what I'm saying is these loops, these vacuum loops, um, do have observable effects, and they, they, you know, they, they carry energy. Okay. And according to general relativity, everything that carries energy will, because of the equivalent principle, will couple to gravity. However, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So we're just looking at a very simple matter field, a scale field. Here it's 
it's with energy momentum. And because of the equivalence principle, I can fix the expectation value of this energy momentum to basically take the form of some um, space-time dependent quantity called rho vacuum times the metric. That's just a statement of the equivalence principle. And if I go back now into the Einstein equation, and where I saw this bare cosmological constant, I add in this vacuum expectation value, right? You basically end up with some, something that looks like an effective cosmological constant, which carries the bare cosmological constant plus um, this vacuum energy. I forgot to tell you that the dark energy basically fixes this vacuum energy, right? Second, so could be 1.10, um, 120 orders of magnitude. Okay, so let's go back and continue our calculation. It's actually important that we go through this because I want us to see what the culprit is. What the cosmic, what the real bad part of the cosmological constant problem is. Okay, so I basically calculate the energy density due to the T on um, the zero zero component, the energy momentum tensor, and that basically becomes this integral, where this is basically the frequency. I got this frequency by expanding this field into a bunch of harmonic oscillator modes with a given dispersion relation and, there's, and uh, defining my vacuum. So I do this calculation, and basically what I find, I just substitute this guy in here, and of course this thing is infinite, so I impose some kind of cutoff at some scale m to the fourth. So for example, if, m, if we were talking about the electroweak theory, our standard model, that could be the TeV scale. If it's the mass of the electron, right, it'll be um, KeV. Um, sorry, 100 electron volts. Is that correct? Electrons mass, 100 electron volts? <coughs> Roughly? Okay. Yeah. But the basic point is, if this gets added into this, plus the bare cosmological constant, this thing is way off. So the, the physics that we trust, the same physics that we trust to calculate the Lamb shift, enters in, okay, to the vacuum energy such that basically disagrees by um, a part of 120 orders of magnitude. So that's one way of thinking about the cosmological constant problem. That's just one contribution, though, to the cosmological, to the vacuum energy. So let's actually, um, you know, I call this a collusion of scales. This is in the spirit of, um, you know, how some of your colleagues like to give puns and talks. Um, so due to the equivalence principle, all these vacuum loops, so that's one vacuum loop, but there's a more serious problem. Because you can, there's a, a, a nice word, you can renormalize this vacuum loop, and you get a logarithmic correction to this renormalization, but if you go to two loops now, you have to do it again, and up to three loops. And that is what we call a vacuum instability. And this is actually the real problem here for general relativity. And the reason why is because this cutoff, because you have this cutoff dependence on your theory that goes as m to the fourth, energy scale to the fourth. So, so either, you know, we just, we're just not able to do the calculation, but, it's, but if this vacuum energy is to agree with the physics that we trust, our standard model in general relativity, um, then we have some ridiculous um, mismatch and with observation, or something needs to be done. Either, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of talk about what possibly could be done. So first of all, let's revisit the assumptions that were made. Um, and I'm gonna assume some coffee break on. Pardon me. So the first thing that we assume is that we assume the validity of these highly ultraviolet properties of quantum field theory of our standard model, which is a quantum field theory. I like to tell a joke. I mean, I, when I was at um, Penn, one of my mentors, a guy named John Collins, a great uh, physicist, and he once told me, there's only one quantum field theory. It's called a standard model. <coughs> so so um, I guess that's not a funny joke. <laughs> Um, the equivalent, we also assume that the equivalence principle right, holds for quantum vacuum energy. It gravitates the same way as classical matter. That was, a, that was kind of an assumption. We also assume that dark energy is a pure effective cosmological constant. It doesn't vary locally. Those are the three things we assume. 
You can say these assumptions were obvious. So I'm going to now, of course, put in my opinion now, OK? So I'm now going to talk about um, there have been over X amount of years. Uh, when I was a postdoc, I started thinking about the cosmological constant problem. And then I was warned that if I wanted to get a job, I should not work on this problem. Um, <laughs> And so I, I, I continued to work on the problem. Um, but once I got a job, I stopped working on it because I realized that I would get in trouble and I wouldn't get tenure. Right? Um, and I'm, anyway, that's another long story. We can talk about it a little bit. Um, so, this, my opinion is that the cost of this problem suggests that we need new physics that lives at the interface between quantum mechanics and gravity. And I'm not saying that we need quantum gravity. I'm just saying there's some interesting interface that needs to be taken, looked at more carefully. Obviously, the problem remains unsolved, and I'm not going to produce at this colloquium, unfortunately, and in this universe, I'm not going to produce a solution to the problem, okay? I'm just going to give some opinions and some insights of what, some directions that I think are a little bit promising. So let's talk about the anatomy of lambda. So what, what are some ways we can um, think about addressing the problem? Well, actually, the first story of this happened right here in Chicago with Mike Turner um, um, and some other colleagues, where they modified general relativity to account for dark energy. You have self-accelerating solutions, um, these so-called F of R theories. All right, so that's actually how this stuff is connected to, to your institution. You can modify gravity. Um, you can do full-blown quantum gravity. And you know, I have some friends here in Chicago, Saab Seti, who takes this problem very seriously. And we, um, we drink um, liquids at night talking about his take on the problem, right? Um, or we could change our perspective on the cosmological constant. And or we can do all three. Maybe there's some mix of all three. And in fact, I'm going to talk about a mix of all three of them today. Or give up. And one way to give up is this way. All right? <laughs> and I know that I'm in like, I'm in good, I, I, I was told to not bring this issue up. And I said, but I'm, I'm, I'm amongst friends here. You know, and in fact, you know, Saab is here, and Saab likes this slide, actually. Um, and the basic idea is that you can, you know, you can imagine that inflation, if it happens at very high scales, you can produce false vacuum bubbles that will also inflate. And you can imagine that string theory, because it emits many mark, you know, vacuum um, with different coupling constants, you, know, you can imagine populating those situations um, in these in these um, in these inflating bubbles. And we just hit the jackpot right here. Okay, now. My colleagues off has a different take on this, and so um, and, and it's really, um, really interesting and sometimes controversial. And I think that it should be, we should continue looking at that. But I have a wish list for solve, <coughs> which is that if you believe in this thing, you still have to have a well-controlled realization of inflation and strength theory. And I know that's something that he's thinking a lot about how to re how to do it properly. Um, how exactly um, does the laws actually change in the different inflation in pocket universes? Um, it, and of course, this is, um, you know, I, I see that, you know, another book I grew up with is a book by Bob Wall. And I learned about geodesic incompleteness in that book. And so we know that inflation is geodesic incomplete. Deal with that. <laughs> OK. Um, so. But there are some old attempts that people have. One, uh, one attempt is, look, just introduce, you know, Rocky's favorite scalar field. Right? You can always introduce a scalar field to deal with the problem. You can introduce a field that eats up the vacuum and it self adjusts the cosmological constant. It's a large cosmological constant. But Steven Weinberg, this is called self adjustment, is a noble theory that Weinberg has that applies to a wide class of such models. Um, and all it assumes is local quantum invariance. Um, um, of your fields, and also that the, when the, once the field relaxes to its vacuum after eating up the eating up the cosmological constant, that is translationally invariant. With these two assumptions, 
Uh, he proves a local theorem that it can't be done. So, so most of the problem, actually, if you really think deeply and for a, a, a couple of years about this problem, stems from the app applying perturbative quantum field theory coupled to classical general relativity. Of course, this is where you can actually formulate the problem. Okay? And so there are some assumptions, and I mentioned these assumptions. Uh, and one perspective you might want to do is you might want to think about self-adjusting mechanism, mechanism that, but instead of adding something to the theory, instead of adding a new degree of, degree of freedom to the theory, let it be the cosmological constant itself. So promote the cosmological constant to a dynamical variable in a way that is kosher. What I mean by that is that if you do quantum mechanics, for example, and I want to promote position and momentum to dynamical variable, they must be conjugate to each other, even at the level of the classical theory. So you make them canonically conjugate to each other, meaning that there's a non-vanishing Poisson bracket. That's one thing you can do. So you address this issue at the level of the Hamiltonian of general relativity and make sure you do things carefully. So the idea here is maybe what we can do is promote the cosmological constant to something that looks like an operator, like an observable. That's one idea. But before that, I actually want to point to, I think, what I, what I consider to be a promising approach. And this is work done by uh, Antonio Padilla and um, Nemanja Caliper, because it's, a, it's a, again, this, I want to talk about new directions and not things that, you know, people have been trying to do in the past, but some promising new directions. And I think this is actually something very promising. Um, and so let me, kind of tell you what the idea is here. It's called sequestered. Okay, what is sequestered? Well, imagine that um, you know, there's a bunch, of, everybody's you know, randomly populated in, in, in this room, and I don't know, I, um, you know, a crane comes and takes some of you and puts you into another room, right? I've sequestered some of you into that room. And there's a mechanism that did that, and that was a crane. So in this case, we have space-time. The cosmological constant is like occupying space-time, there's a zero mode that, that's constant everywhere. And the idea here is that there is some extra, there's something topological that's, uh, that it's a field, as you imagine, and it has flux. And that this flux basically is, sequesters the cosmological constant at the boundary of, the, uh, um, of that space, and it doesn't couple to the metric because it's topological. Somehow the cosmological constant has to communicate with that. So what you have to do is modify um, gravity such that, so you promote the cosmological constant to a global parameter. So it's still a constant, but you vary it globally. And I'll show you that in a second. So it's kind of like a Lagrange multiplier, okay? With the, which is gonna satisfy certain constraints <coughs> due to its equations of motion. And that constraint will be to sequester the vacuum energy. So then you, what, what you also do, you do two things. You promote the cosmological constant to a global parameter. Then you, the, then you take your standard model with all the vacuum loops, and then you couple it to another parameter. Right? So there's another parameter that basically is coupling to the metric, which couples to the matter set. So your, your standard model couples to the metric because of the equivalence principle. Then you, they do a very interesting trick where they couple this thing to something that looks like a conformal rescale of the metric. Okay. Then you vary both of these parameters, and then what they find is that all the vacuum energy drops out of the equations of motion. Let's see how that works. So, general relativity, you can just write your matter equation, whatever it is, and what they do is they have this parameter, lambda, that's both rescale the metric in this particular way and multiplies the matter equation by this rescale of the metric to the fourth power. Why this fourth power? Remember that the vacuum loops are scaling as m to the fourth. So this thing goes along for the ride. 
Then they have this, their cosmological constant. Mm -hmm. Then they have some function that depends on the cosmological constant and this lambda parameter that couples to the matter sector. So they have this thing that's, that seems to be, at, it's, at, it's a topological, it's going to end up being a topological term. That's the important thing. So think about like, um, um, you know, something like the gauss bonnet term, for example, or a boundary term of your space-time. It has no coupling to the metric. So in this case, you have some function. It's unspecified yet. They're being very general. But you let lambda, the cosmological constant, and the small lambda, which is coupled to the matter sector, they're communicating with each other in this particular way. If you now vary the Lagrangian by letting lambda vary, not spatially, but globally, and small lambda vary, you end up with two equations of motion. The prime, this is the derivatives with respect to lambda. This, um, this is um, the equation of motion by varying this action with respect to small lambda and big lambda. And then you combine these two equations, you basically divide them through. And you end up that the cosmological constant is now the trace of the spatial average of the energy momentum tensor. That just means the spatial average is just the integral over the three volume times the determinant of the metric times the energy momentum tensor divided by the volume of space. That's the spatial average. OK. This, is, this third equation is the Einstein field equations with the cosmological constant. And this is the energy momentum tensor. If I substitute this thing now, into the Einstein equation. Here we go. For lambda, I substitute lambda to here. I get this equation. And now I put in my vacuum energy plus local excitations, so non zero modes. And if I plug it in to this equation, all the vacuum energy and the cosmological constant drops out. So this is the basic idea of sequester. Now, what I'm not showing you here is what exactly is this Lagrangian. And you'll find it interesting that when they first wrote their paper about five years ago, they didn't know what that Lagrangian was. It turns out that um, this, um, the Lagrangian that does it is very similar to something that looks like the axion. There's a topological term involving some flux times the axion. That's, so that's the type of theory that seems to work in sequestering the cosmological constant. And the basic idea here is that the flux in this term is basically stealing away the vacuum energy and depositing the, depositing the vacuum energy um, at the boundary of the manifold. Now I see that Craig is smiling because it's reminiscent of other things. Um, but basically, there's another way in hindsight to see why this is working. If something like the cosmological constant is um, is dropping out. That means there's some kind of symmetry at work here. And in fact, there is a symmetry in the system. If I rescale this lambda by some rescale um, parameter and the cosmological constant, the, um, as well as my metric perturbations, the action is invariant. It's almost invariant with corrections at those that's very tiny. And vice versa. There's also a shift symmetry. By shifting lambda, the action is also invariant. And this is a very high power scale, for example. All right. So that's one idea. How much time do I have? Oh, really? I had no I, I, I was rushing so much. Was, um, OK. I'm sorry. I, I think I went too fast. 25? All right. <clears throat> OK. Um, so. There's another Chicago story. This is um, one of my colleagues, Lee, who was a postdoc here a long time ago. And um, it's good, to, I mean, so I um, worked a long time ago when I was at, at Imperial with Joao. And we were on a train ride to New York um, last year. And we started saying, you know what, let's just pick something really hard to work on and go for it. So we started thinking about the cosmological constant problem again. Um, and um, we had this idea that was motivated from a very, very bad thing, OK? And so I'm not going to talk about that bad thing, because that bad thing involves a particular type of quantum gravity that, is, that a lot of people don't like, OK? So I'm not going to go there, 
unless you really want me to, but I'm not. But what I want to do is, um, so there is, many of you, if you haven't heard, this is some, something called the first order um, formalism of general relativity. And in that formalism, you kind of do your best to treat gravity as a gauge theory. So what you do is you take your Lorentz group, right, and you promote that thing to a, a connection. You, you have a connection, just like in gauge theory, right, you have a gauge field, you have a gauge field here that is that carries local events in variant, and you promote that thing, and you can write down curvature for that object. So you have this connection. And you also have a frame field, which is you know, pretty much the metric. And these two things are independent. And you write down a, a general action for that. And this is kind of a one way of doing it. So um, pardon my bad notation, but this allows me to do calculations very quickly. But in, in terms of good old-fashioned general relativity, this is nothing more than, the, than um, the determinant of the metric. And this is nothing more than the volume form coupled to the cosmological constant. And this is um, a Lagrange multiplier that enforces the constraints that give me that general relativity. Okay? That's all you need to know for this. Um, so what we discovered, let me just tell you what we discovered. We promoted the cosmological constant in this picture to um, a dynamical variable by finding its canonical conjugate. The same way if I, it's like having P for X. So think of the cosmological constant as X, and we want to find the momentum conjugate for the cosmological constant. The problem is that uh, uh, Mark Hano kind of beat us to this uh, 15 years ago. He was trying to do something called unimodular gravity, and you can find that the cosmological constant is conjugate to something that is like, a, like the volume form. Okay, to the, to the volume form. We found another conjugate variable. And that conjugate variable is not the cosmological constant, it's one of the cosmological constant. And this particular topological term, that's very similar to what we call an instanton number, okay, in gauge theories. But this is a topological invariant. It's called a Pontryagin density, but it's basically curvature squared, roughly, but it's topological. It doesn't couple to the metric. And then you can check that by going to the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity. This is just geography with ADM variables. And you can compute the Poisson bracket. This is what we call the Chern Simons form for the gravitational connection. All right. Um, condensed matter physicists use this a lot to talk about the quantum law effect for uh, electromagnetism. Um, gravity has a version of that as well. This is related to this topological term. This is just this object living at the boundary of a four-dimensional space-time. And it turns out if you compute a Poisson bracket, it is indeed one for the cosmological constant. So what we have is the cosmological constant as a function of time uh, for a given slicing. This is still different variant. Um, and this is this canonical conjugate. And in other words, by doing this, by promoting the cosmological constant to a dynamical variable, this term is, is necessary, at, at least for us to preserve the symmetries of general relativity. And we end up now with an equation for the cosmological constant. It has a fixed point, meaning that if you take off all space time dependence on this thing, and that fixed point says that the cosmological constant is proportional to this object here, divided by the volume form. And this is very similar to sequestered, except that we got it in a different way. But let things got, get a little bit more interesting, and I now want our cosmology hats to come on. I also wanted to mention that um, <coughs> this, there's another place where you see this, um, in general, the, uh, the trace of this topological term is actually related to something called a quantum anomaly, that if this thing is non-vanishing, according to um, the standard model, for example, you will generate fermion currents. So let's keep that in mind. Okay. But now, everything that we did in this formalism is not yet general relativity. Right? It's not GR with a metric and a Christoffel symbol. We have to get to that. But to do that, you must actually go back and solve Right? The metric compatibility conditions, right? And what you find is that 
something weird pops up, we weren't expecting it, which is that the cosmological constant is actually the torsion. All right, so this is a, something called torsion. It's basically, the, it's like an anti-symmetry property by parallel transport the metric. All right, or the inability to close a parallel ramp by parallel transporting the metric. And the, this thing, this torsion, is in fact a cosmological constant times a metric. Now that's going to be interesting because now if I go back and I do general relativity properly, um, we get an effective theory for the cosmological constant that's not dynamical. And this is just a cosmological constant, the bare cosmological constant. Um, I apologize, this is, um, this is supposed to be the curvature tensor of general relativity. I don't know, this is a, actually a typo, this should be R. And we have a kinetic term for the cosmological constant. We didn't have this at first. It's starting to look like a scalar field theory, but it's not, it's an ugly one, because we have one over the cosmological constant, square here. But you can write down the equations of motion, say, you put it in an expanded background, and you ask what happens to this thing. And of course, this is the R or dual term, term as well. This is coming from here. Dual actually is just, you hit a, the curvature tensor with the anti-symmetric tensor. And you have this effective potential that looks like this. However, you can play a little trick and do a, a, a redefine the field. Remember, lambda is a function of x mu. And so I do a, a field redefinition. And what happens is that this theory becomes an ordinary scalar field theory with a particular potential that has this form, which should start looking familiar to some of you who believe in something called quintessence. But remember, it's a cosmological dynamic. I didn't put in any quintessence by hand. Um, so let's look at what the potential looks like. In the lambda picture, it's this kind of ugly thing. But remember, it's a time-dependent potential. The reason why is because this RR dual, this topological piece, is no longer, is actually, when I integrate it by parts, it's no longer topological because lambda is dynamical. And so the potential, in terms of using all my intuition for canonically normalized scale fields, has the following form. <coughs> Red is, um, is the field at early time, so at some initial time. It has a potential well that keeps it fixed at some minimum. And as time, cosmic time evolves, the potential becomes um, this decreasing exponent, increasing exponential. And what we find is that lambda basically um, becomes more and more, not lambda, phi becomes more and more negative as time goes on. So therefore, the cosmological constant exponentially dies off. And so if you look at this numerically, and we basically find for a huge class of initial conditions, this is basically the behavior of, uh, as you look at cosmic time, in this case, we see that cosmological constant dies off. It doesn't quite go to zero. In fact, you can do some analytics and show that basically it goes as Hubble squared if Hubble starts off initially large, for example, huge vacuum energy. Um, and it gets exponentially decayed as a function of Hubble squared times the parameter, parameters that depend on the initial conditions. All right, this is sort of a generic effect. This is all preliminary stuff. We haven't put a paper out on this stuff. So please take this, uh, some of this with, 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 with caveats. But this is what we seem to be getting. But here's something I want to leave for the, for the cosmologists, um, which is that this should also imply that if you think of this thing as um, a dynamical W, that it has oscillations on scales smaller than Hubble. And so the question is, if I have an oscillated, highly oscillated equation state parameter from recombination to now, for example, what would be the observational consequences of that? That's a question. All right. So, um, good. There's going to be time for lots of questions. <clears throat> so, I hope I can conv convince you that the dark energy cosmological constant problem is for real. It's based on real physics. And that real physics is, um, is at tension with what we see. You know, we should all be spooked out with dark, by dark energy. Uh, I presented two promising approaches. One approach um, 
is sequestered, which stabilizes the vacuum energy and uses new symmetries to degravitate the vacuum energy. There's lots of follow-up work on that. Um, I think it's all very interesting. Um, if we make the lambda dynamical, uh, we allow a new coupling between the cosmological constant and the boundary term of space-time related to the space-time curvature itself. Both approaches are similar in that it, it, both approaches actually, this is the thing I wanted to kind of take away. I'm not claiming that either of these things will solve the cosmological constant problem or could be the identity of dark energy. But one thing I forgot to say is that in the suppressor mechanism, you cannot identify that the relaxed lambda with dark energy. You still need to put dark energy in that model. Okay. Um, so in other words, I'm not trying to say that either of these mechanisms is the right direction. They're just new stuff and it's basically an invitation for us to not give up on the cosmological constant problem or on dark energy. Because it hasn't given up on us. <laughs> um, but, um, but there's something interesting about both these approaches, which is that it's what, you know, one of the things we all know about general relativity, and one of the first things I learned about general relativity, is that you know, the present formulation of the theory is insensitive to topology. You know, you have beautiful Einstein Hill of gravity, cosmological constant, but then topology is indeterminate. What it seems to be saying is that the cosmological constant seems to care about that. Because in both of these approaches, you see, you see the effects of the boundary of space um, is communicated with the cosmological constant. All right, and that's those are two things that popped up in both of these approaches, and two things that seem to be new. By the way, this is nothing new. Um, you know, one of our our heroes, Sidney Coleman. One of his approaches back in the days, right, to the cosmological constant, was to use, top, you know, use topology. Unfortunately, it didn't really work because he was using Euclidean quantum gravity. But that idea seems to be resurfacing. Um, so this is also reminiscent of a paper that I, I'm not smart enough to understand. Okay, I learned that from you, by the way. That's a good. This is like a best hour. <laughs> But the idea is very interesting. And they, it's a recent paper that came out last week by Banks and Fishler that says that the cosmological constant actually should live at the boundary of space time as well, sort of reminiscent of black hole holography. And again, this is all pointed to this, this, this theme. Uh, but my question really is um, you know, we should then think about what the observational effects of such ideas would be. So I leave that for us to um, scratch our heads on. Thanks for having me. Size relative to h squared go down, or is it always so? That's h squared here. Yeah. So if you divided, so in units of h squared, yeah, it's given by that exponential. Yes. And all of those things are constants in there. I'm confused. Yeah. So so that's why this is a, a caveat because um, we are these two things um, depend sensitively on the initial conditions. And we have not worked that out yet. But they don't vary with time. No, the only thing that varies with fixed, time yeah. is the h squared. Yeah. So is the value of lambda with is lambda over h squared diminish with time? Does that go? Yes. So it becomes exponentially small. Yes. So the biggest it ever gets is h squared. Yeah. And then it goes. Away. That's what it seems to be saying. But we should take it with a, a grain of salt, sand. Although, actually, now I'm, I'm confused again, because e to the minus h squared, h squared is getting smaller with time, so it's not damping. Yeah, um, so that's why, you know, we, okay. 
You need to look at the equations a little okay. more than that. This is an approximation. But um, we're pretty sure that this is what's happening. Well. Okay. Yeah, the oscillations. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's really interesting that I did look up um, yesterday because I, I, I was like, this is a bit weird and I'm, I don't want to make a fool out of myself. So I did look for papers on these exponential potentials. And of course, some Russian person <laughs> found some exact solutions to the problem. Um, and in fact, they used these potentials actually in the early days um, to actually get inflation. So if I have a scale field with this, these exponential potentials, you do have a, a tractor fixed point to, um, that drives you into, into, into inflation. But here's what's weird. That's the five. Right? But remember, lambda is e to the 5. So it's a totally different, right? similar equations, but different inter interpretations. I just found it weird that you get something that looks like quintessence without putting quintessence in, or even wanting it. I'm not claiming that. I'm not trying to sell anything. Craig, I thought you had a question. Well, I have lots of questions, um, since you asked. <laughs> so, so, so you have one. So the oscillations, that's the most interesting thing. You made a prediction. So, um, so that bit of oscillate. So, but it, it, does it approach constant or does it always oscillate? I constant? don't know. Yeah, I mean, okay. so we, yeah. right now what's going on is, um, you know, my poor graduate student yeah. is um, struggling over these things because I'm, I'm busy being like a lazy professor. Okay, no, <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. another question is, um, it has a, it has a value, but it has a value. You know, yes. Um, in the limit, 22, 22. Um, what sets the value? Yes, it does. I think at, at the end of the day, it's going gonna, it's gonna to boil down to the initial conditions. So does that mean you're going back to multi -verse? Could be anything. And it's, yeah, I mean, putting a, a yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm going to warm out just to say. I'm not going to solve that. That's that that problem, you know, the Y number. We talked about this this morning. Yeah. I think yeah. that that's going to require some. But you do have a frame, um, and you have a bunch of you have a bunch of equations, right? And so um, the number comes out of the equations, right? It's a parameter. And so so if you if if, 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 if this lambda is generated at the electric scale and the numbers work out, we know that all these nice yeah. coincidences. The geometric mean between the electric weak scale and the Planck scale you could work give you lambda, and you might be able to look at that. Okay. Yeah. So the relation to QC. But yeah. I'll quit physics if that works out because I'll just go on the beach and you know <laughs> play my sax. I did the Right. <laughs> Thanks for asking. I'm really scared that Bob Wall hasn't asked a question yet, so that's not very happy. Doesn't ask a question. So you mentioned. Uh, there are some topological here. Yes. Yes. So you mentioned there are some topological origin for the cosmic constant. Sometimes uh, the topology means there are some discrete uh, values. So yes. I'm just curious uh, uh, if I follow that logic, uh, uh, what's the discreteness for this uh, sequestering approach or integral approach? Very good. So there's a fancy word that Namanian, these people, they call menagerie, right? Like if you go around the space, Thing, it, the flux jumps up by some some unit, and that's kind of what's going on here. I don't. So that's for the that's what they um, they talk about. Um, I don't have. A, I don't. It's a really good question, and I, I I don't have an intuition for it. But it's a really good question. You also see this with with, with the quantum ball effect. You have these level these levels, and that's kind of why the Turing Simons term actually does really well. And basically, you have these the top the topological term carries information about. The, about these extra plateaus, right? It's just, I think that's kind of the flavor of what you're asking, and it's a really good question. Um, I, I can give you an offline answer, but again, I don't want to reveal my prejudice for particular types of theories of quantum gravity. Uh, so I'll keep my peace. We're not you can share if you want. <laughs> so many of you have probably heard about something called all the Part of Hawking state. So, you know, there's a, a Wheeler-DeWitt equation. 
something like the Schrodinger equation for quantum mechanics, for, for gravity. Except instead of, uh, you know, the Schrodinger equation that's time dependent, right, gravity is a constraint system, so the Hamiltonian of general relativity will annihilate this wave function. It turns out that that's what Hawking and Hawking came up with. There's some wave function of the universe, okay? It turns out that there's a similar object in, um, in these particular gauge theoretic formulations of gravity that actually is this churn Simon state. But it's a churn Simon state of gravity. And when you look at the phase information in that wave function, you see in that phase information, if you were to interpret this as e to the i px, where p and x is, you see that the cosmological constant is, from that perspective, canonically conjugate to this topological term. And then you can think of um, this term, this wave function, um, actually is a wave function that describes the sitter space. But the problem is that um, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's actually wrong because it has negative probability densities and you know, all these weird things about it. So we kind of use some of that in inspiration to help us find this, this point. You know, when you have a wave function, it is related to this thing we talked about this morning, this time variable. Um, but anyway, that's, you know. It seems like you're trying to banish it to the yes. edge space. Like, you really don't want it to be zero. You want it to have a finite value. Yes. Just something much bigger than the Planck scale, so that you can get the value very small. So yes. Somewhere in between. Yes. I, I definitely don't want it to banish. Right. Oh, I forgot to mention that there is something actually that's reminiscent of, uh, there's something that's actually reminiscent. This is basically, something that looks like a back reaction. And I, I, I can't get into it right now, but a long time ago, when I was a postdoc, um, some Italian people and Rocky wrote a paper on, on um, that you can have inflation, for example, and density perturbations are formed, especially gravitational perturbations, and they can develop um, well into today and re-enter as a back reactive effect. Um, and it could contribute potentially to some of the dark energy, all right? And so there's something about this that's kind of reminiscent of it, um, but that's um, a speculation. So, so if we can go and we can, we can measure the uniformity of dark energy over the sky, yes. right? Where, where does this lead you as far as sub horizon scale things and things enter in the horizon? That's, I mean, that's an excellent question. That's a really, really good, I mean, I like that question, but I'm scared of that question, actually. Because remember, this thing is, that we're saying that this lambda has a homogeneous piece, right? Like, you know how we have our infoton field, it breaks up into a homogeneous common system, a time dependence piece, plus fluctuations. And it's a scale field theory with a, 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 a complicated enough potential. So I can imagine that this thing might actually clump up and have spatial gradients. Um, and that might be a bad thing, or uh, something that might lead to... Or it could be a great thing, right, if we see it. It could be, it could be an interesting thing in the following way, right? Um, since I think you study compact objects, right? Me? Yeah. I'm sure, I guess okay. you could say stars. <laughs> okay. More compact than the universe. More compact than the universe. Okay. <laughs> And still, but you know, one of the things that this thing could do potentially, all right, so one way of asking, the, my PhD advisor, Robert Brandenburg, once told me the following thing. He said, um, where is a cosmological, you know, why is a cosmological constant not gravitate? That's one way of thinking about cosmology. Or well, why does it not gravitate as much as it should, right? A lot much that it should. That it should. That's one way of thinking. Another way of asking that question, of reformulating that question is, where is the cosmological constant hiding? Right? So if some of it might be hiding in some kind of compact star, because that's, some, that's an object that has huge gradients and highly dense, and some of that scale of field could become that. Right? Sort of like these boson stars, for example. Or just inside hadrons. Oh, inside hadrons. Well, that's BJ's idea. Yeah. Right? That was BJ's idea. Yeah. He might be right after all. Yeah. I mean, He's always right. Except about anything. It's another, it's another baseball joke. <laughs>